is accounting for income taxes. Um, the important thing to know here is that we're really not talking about tax accounting from the standpoint of what the detailed tax rules. What we're talking about is accounting for gap financial statements for taxes and tax income taxes in particular. And so the, the main uh, gist of what we're going to be working on today is uh, no, number one, understanding how, what are the basic concepts behind accounting for income taxes. We're going to talk about some of the additional issues like um, uh, net operating loss carry forwards and valuation allowances. And then we're going to explain how to, how to deal with carry, loss carrybacks, but not so much carrybacks right now. It's, it's just carry forwards. And then we'll, we'll take a look at one example of um, the presentation of deferred taxes in the, in the balance sheet and income statement. Okay, so let's get started. We'll take a look here. Let me just put it in, the, in the presentation mode here. Uh, we have one basic simple example, uh, and it's it's never this simple, I can assure you. In its first year of operations, ABC Company has $10 million of pre-tax book income and, and $10 million of taxable income. That is, there's no book tax differences. The tax rate is 21%, record the tax expense. And so at the end of the year, um, we're going to record income tax expense as a debit and income tax payable for a credit. And in fact, what we're going to be focusing in on is that credit and make the income tax expense becomes the, the plug figure. We owe 21% and that's going to be due with the tax return when we file the tax return within the next year. Now, Let's do the same example, except that instead of making $10 million, they, the company lost $10 million. And it was the same for book and for tax. Um, just to give a little bit of historical perspective, that was in year three. In year one, they made $3 million, and in, in year two, $4 million. And they're expected to earn sufficient future taxable income to utilize the, the NOL, which means net operating loss, carry forward in future years. At, at some times we have a carry back, uh, like um, during COVID, they had a special rule that allowed a, a carry back. Um, but in general, right now we only have carry forwards, and the tax rate is 21%. We expect to get, earn $1 million in year four, the very next year, and we're going to have sufficient future taxable income to, to use up all $10 million of the net operating loss. So they, these losses can be carried forward 20 years and used to offset up to 80% taxable income in those carry forward years. So let's take a look at it. What we need to do is to determine the assets and liabilities and make the income tax expense, or in this case, income tax benefit, the plug figure. So the first thing we start out with is what are we going to owe this year or what are we going to get this year from filing our tax return. We're going to, um, that is, uh, we're not going to owe anything, but in the, so the answer is zero there, but we're going to get a refund next year because we're expecting to have $1 million of taxable income $1 million of taxable income in year four. And we can use $1 million of the $10 million to offset 80% of that $1 million. So we take the $1 million times 80%, that gives us 800000 times 21%, and that'll give us 168000 That is kind of like a receivable. Um, and we're, it's called a deferred tax asset, but it's a current asset because we're going to receive it within the next year. Now, it says that we'll have sufficient future taxable income to use the NOL, NOL carry forward in future years. So the long-term deferred tax asset is going to be one, uh, the $10 million minus the $1 million, because we're using that in the first year, $9 million. Um, at times, 
and, and we'll use that up at the 80% tax rate. And so we take, um, hey Siri, what is 9 million times 21%? That would be 1,890,000. Okay. Oh, plus we get the other 200,000. So not only are we going to get the the 9 million, but there's another 20, 200,000, the 20 percent of the of the 1 million. So we have, hey Siri, what is 9 million 200,000 times 21 percent? 9 million 200,000 times 21 percent is 1 million 932,000. Okay, so we will have a, a benefit of the future, 1,932,000. It's limited in any one year to 80% of the taxable income in that year. We can't offset more than 80% of it. And so uh, our total benefit is going to be 2.1 million, of which 168,000 is current, and the long-term part is 1,932,000. Notice we have income tax benefit here, which is basically income tax expense with a credit balance. And that, that's a plug figure. When we do our, and so we credit that um, income tax benefit, it's kind of like income. And when we show our income statement for GAAP purposes, we have this, this is at the bottom of the income statement, pre-tax loss is 10 million. We have this benefit, 2.1 million, so that Really, after tax, we only lost 7.9 million. Um, th in this way, the government shares in our pain and in our gain. When we have a gain, they take some of it. That's income tax expense. But when we have a, a loss, at least in some time, many, many cases, the government will give us a refund, at least to the extent that you have future taxable income that can be used. Um, to uh, buy those net operating loss carry forwards. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the sort of setting that income taxes live in. Corporations must file income tax returns following the rules set forth by the Internal Revenue Code in, and, and enforced by the Internal Revenue Service, which is the cops of that and make sure that we're following the code, the law. GAAP and tax rules differ. Um, and we can talk about that, but there's, there's a variety of reasons why they, they are different. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more in a, in a slide coming right up. But what we end up with ultimately is we have income tax expense that we show on the income statement for GAAP purposes, and we have income tax payable that we file according as determined according to the Internal Revenue Code. And in many cases, there will be a difference between those two. The reason for these differences? Well, GAAP financial statements are to help investors their main purpose is to help investors make decisions about companies. Uh, in essence, we want the, those investors to allocate their money to the good investments and away from the bad investments. And that's the purpose of GAAP financial statements. On the other hand, the tax return, the purpose is to collect revenue to support the government. But in determining the tax rules, there's a whole hodgepodge of different political considerations that go into determining what is and isn't taxable income. Um, so we have completely different objectives, and that hodgepodge of different rules is driven largely by political, you know, who's the donor for this campaign or that campaign, and what, what do they want, those donors? It's, it's not as pretty as we would like it to be. So now let's talk about the, these differences. We know that there's differences between GAAP or book and, and taxable income. Sometimes those differences are permanent. For example, if we have municipal bond interest, that municipal bond interest income is definitely includable in GAAP income. 
right? It's the income that we earn during the year. But for our tax return, it is excluded. Right? We have a specific exclusion for that in the Internal Revenue Code, somewhere around 100, 103 or something like that. I forgot the exact code section. Um, and then, so we have this permanent difference. It never gets taxed for tax purposes, and it always is included in gap income. Now let's talk about permanent difference. Uh, another permanent difference is dividends received deduction. So if one company owns shares in another company, then according, depending on how much of the, the shares in the other company, they will get a, re, a dividends received deduction. And the idea here is to prevent double or even triple taxation uh, to reduce the, the, the possibility of triple or more taxation on dividends paid be between companies. And dividends received deductions are permanent. They are permanent difference. As dividend income will be income for GAAP purposes and will not be income to the extent of the, of the percentage received deduction now or ever in the future for tax purposes. Those permanent differences are actually very easy. We'll deal with them, but in general, the idea with permanent differences is we take into account the permanent difference for both the tax due, or the tax payable, and the tax expense. So we, we just accept that as a, re, as a change in the tax expense currently. The hard part is in the temporary differences, where book and taxable income are reported in different accounting periods. Let me sh first let's take a look at this this um, permanent difference and how that's accounted for. In its first year of operations, ABC Company has ten million dollars of book income and nine million dollars of taxable income. This difference is due entirely to ABC's receipt of a million dollars of tax-free interest income. That tax-free interest income will never be taxed. It's a permanent difference. It's not like it's going to flip around at some time in the future. This is never going to be taxed. So what we consider is both uh, for the tax due, uh, we take, all right, well, um, taxable income is only $9 million. Hey, Siri, what is $9 million times 21%? 9 million times 21% is 1,890,000. So that becomes our income tax payable. But because there's no um, switch back or reversal effect, that's also our income tax expense. So now let's just talk a little bit about the concepts. We just uh, finished talking about Chapter 6. And we recognize that, you know, we learned that book income is recognized, revenue is recognized, after we go through these five steps. We identify the contract, identify the separate performance obligations in the contract, then we determine the transaction price, and we allocate that transaction price to each of the performance obligations, and we recognize revenue when those performance obligations are uh, resolved or we've, we've, we've met those performance obligations. For taxable, per, taxable income, there's a whole variety of different uh, specific rules, but the general notion is that we use something called the all events test. And the all events is, is this two-pronged uh, concept uh, that applies to revenues and three-pronged for deductions. And I'm not going to go any, into it any depth because in general, what we're going to do is, except for the very broad things, we're just going to assume that you understand that we'll, we'll tell you what, what the, um, the difference is for book and tax purposes. And you don't, the purpose of this course is not that you know the, tax dif the book tax differences. It's that you know how to apply them in, in determining uh, income tax expense, deferred tax assets, and liabilities, um, and so forth. So here's sort of a, a checklist, the way I, I like to do 
a tax accrual, and this is called a, a tax accrual, first step is to find out how much we're going to have to pay or will we receive with our tax return this year. Put that that put that in because it's it's typically it's like December thirty first, and we uh, are going to file our tax return often in October with extensions, but we file and we report our GAAP financial statements in late January, early February, so we have to estimate how much is going to be due with our tax return, or are we going to get as a refund? That's step one. Number two, what's the effect on future taxes? So how is this, this year's operations going to affect change what we owe in future years or what we're going to receive in future years? Uh, that is deferred tax liabilities or receiving deferred tax assets, which are, I think of them as prepaid tax expense. Um, and so we're going to adjust those deferred tax assets and liabilities. And then once we do those adjustments, we just uh, make debits equal credits by plugging income tax expense, if it's a net debit, or crediting income tax benefit, if it's a net credit. Here's an example. An, an example. In its first year of operations, year one, ABC Properties has $10 million of pre-tax book income and $12 million taxable income. This difference is due entirely to ABC's receipt of $2 million of rent from a tenant uh, that applies to year two. The rate to receive the income is fixed and the amount is ascertainable in year one. And because of those things under the, I believe it's called the claim of right doctrine, uh, that becomes taxable income in year one to the taxpayer. However, for GAAP purposes, that $2 million is allocable to year two as income that's going to be recognized for GAAP purposes in year two. So now we're going to record the tax expense. So we have $12 million of taxable income, and that tax rate is 21%. Hey Siri, what is $12 million? times 21%. 12 million times 21% is 2,520,000. Okay, that's going to be how much we owe this year, 2,520,000. <clears throat> but we have, we are essentially prepaying on that 2 million that, uh, that we get this year for tax purposes, but we're prepaying that it's allocable for GAAP purposes to year two. And so we're paying it now, and we call that, instead of prepaid tax, we'll call it deferred tax asset. It's the same notion, but we're, we're prepaying that 2 million times 21%, which is 420,000. And the difference is our plug to income tax expense. In year two, uh, we don't know anything about other taxable income or gap income, but we know that in year two we have two million dollars of income for for gap purposes um, that we need to we record that as income in year two, and we for we're going to match that with income tax expense that is two million times 20 per, 21%, 420,000. Um, and so we're going to show that $420,000 as an expense in year two when we record $2 million of rent income for GAAP purposes, even though we don't have to pay it because we've prepaid it when we prepaid it here. And so we're going to reduce the prepaid tax or the deferred tax asset by crediting it. That's the example of a deferred tax asset. Here's another example. In its first year of operations, year one, 
ABC Company has $10 million of pre-tax book income and $7 million of taxable income. This difference is due entirely to ABC's use of Section 179 and MACRS that creates a $3 million greater tax deduction than uh, gap tax or gap depreciation expense. So the tax rate is 21%. The first thing we're going to do is figure out how much are we going to owe this year? Hey Siri, what is 7 million times 21%? 7 million times 21% is 1,470,000. So that's how much we're going to owe. We're going to pay that with our tax return that says 7 million, and we're going to pay uh, 1,470,000. Now, we had a, a, a greater tax deduction this year, $3 million, and, and that means we're going to have a lower tax deduction in later years when we have and we'll have a higher taxable income. That is, we're going to have to pay 21% times the $3 million as that flips around and it becomes greater taxable income than book income in the years after year one. And so that deferred tax liability something we're going to owe because we know it's going to flip around um, 3 million times 21 percent or 630,000. And again, we plug income tax expense. It's a plug figure and we end up with 22.1 million. So let's talk about the concept behind future deductible and, and future taxable amounts arising from temporary differences. If we have uh, a deferred tax asset, that means that we've prepaid or we have some sort of uh, refund or reduction in taxes uh, that is essentially owed to us from something we've done now or in prior years. And that's called a deferred tax asset. You could call it prepaid tax if you wanted, although prepaid infers that there's actually been a cat cash payment. That's not always the case that there's been a, a cash payment for prepaid tax or deferred tax. So we call it a deferred tax asset. Now, on other cases where we have a greater deduction or a smaller tax income, um, this year but we're going to have to pay it later because we know that, that we're going to have a higher taxable income in later years, we're going to have a deferred tax liability. And so that's a uh, deferred tax liability. It represents the increase in taxes payable in future years as a result of taxable de temporary differences that existed at the end of the current year. Likewise, deferred tax asset represents the increases in taxes refundable because we prepaid it or this year in future years as a result of deductible temporary differences existing at the end of the current year. All right, so um, we're going to have a tax deduction in the future, but potentially or less taxable income in the future and um, as a result we'll have less tax that's owed and that's uh, in, the, in those future years. We have this essentially prepay, we prepaid that um, and I call it a, and it's called a deferred tax asset. Let's do another example. Chelsea reports GAP or book in revenue, $130,000, and expenses of $60,000 in each of its first three years of operations. For tax purposes, Chelsea also has the same expenses, $60,000, but its revenues vary as $100,000 in year one, $150,000 in year two, and $140,000 in year three. 
We're not going to get into why that is. It could be the installment sale method. It could be like we talked about with uh, claim of right doctrine for rent received. We, we're not going to get into that. We're just saying that this is the pattern. There's going to be even pattern of revenues for gap purposes of 130 for three years. That's 390,000. For tax purposes, it's going to be it's going to vary. 100 in year one, 150 in year two, that's 250, and 140 in year three, that's 390. So it's the same 390, but we're reporting it at different times. And the question is, what is the effect on the accounts of the reporting the different amounts of revenue for GAAP versus for tax? Let's take a look. So for GAAP purposes, in the, we show that in this blue section. And we see that we have revenues, 130 minus expenses, 60. We have $70,000 of pre-tax financial income in all three years. It's different for our tax return. On our tax return, we have 100,000 in year one, 150 in year two, and 140 in year three. So our tax payable is gonna be 16,000, 36,000, and 32,000. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to compare the tax expense for GAAP and the tax payable for tax purposes. And that's going to give us $12,000 in year one. And that becomes how much we're going to owe um, in future years, we have a liability for this $12,000. We're going to set up that liability because we're only paying $16,000, but we have income that will eventually be there for, uh, for another uh, $12,000. And so we're going to take that times the tax rate, and that would be our, our tax, uh, deferred tax liability. Are these differences reported in the financial statements? A absolutely, yes. Um, I'm sorry. I think I may have me messed you up on that. It's it, the different. This is already determining at the the forty percent. So this is the tax payable today, sixteen thousand, and we're gonna. But we know we're gonna have to pay that other twelve thousand, make it twenty eight thousand in the future. So we have a deferred tax liability that increased to 12000 in year one. That's because it is year one, the very first year. There was no balance in that. Now, increase it to, to 12000 In year two, things flip around. We have a greater taxes payable, 36000 than we have tax expense. And so we're going to take some of this liability that we set up that is, the, and I say some, it's for this 8000 And that becomes a reduction in the deferred tax liability in year two. And then in year three, we do the same thing again. And it doesn't always work out eventually. I mean, it just, I mean, it'll just keep on going into the future. And we adjust these live assets and liabilities. In this case, in year three, we have higher tax payable than we have tax expense, and we have a, um, a re an additional tax that's payable, and that's going to be paid out of um, our deferred tax payable. So that's going to be a reduction in deferred tax payable. So let's take a look. How does this look in our journal entries? At the end of year one, First thing we do is look at the income tax that's payable. At the end of at the end of year one, that's sixteen thousand. We know that we're going to have to pay eight thousand of that within one year, so that's going to be a deferred tax payable, current eight thousand. And then we have this additional amount, and it might be in year three or many years out into the future, and that's going to be deferred tax payable long-term or deferred tax liability. Sometimes they refer to it as DTL, deferred tax liability. And so their journal entry is going to look like this for year one. 
And then along comes year two. In year two, oh, we're going to pay 36000 So we put that income tax payable. This is that 1231 year two. We're doing an adjusting entry. We owe 36000 We're reducing the deferred tax liability by 8000 Remember, we had 12000 in there. And to the extent that it remains positive, we're reducing the, the liability by 8000 debiting the liability, and the difference is income tax expense. And that was for the current deferred tax liability. In here, let me, let me just change this. This is actually wrong. I need to get that straightened out there and that should be year two that we make this this entry right here I'll correct that uh, see if we can get back there and so at the end of year two at that point this long-term liability that was set up for four thousand it becomes a current liability because at the end of year at the end of year two, we know that within one year, we're going to have to pay this other $4,000. And so we reclassify deferred tax payable long term by debiting that. That was here. And when we now say, oh, well, at the end of year two, that becomes a current liability. Okay. One last one here. Let's see if we can get back in. I'll have to correct that. I can do that right now. I hope not. You guys. Um, that's year two. And this is year three. Oh, it's, it's a continual thing of, of trying to make, make things better. So in the end of year three, we have income tax payable, that's the 32,000. We have a debit to the deferred tax payable, current, for 4,000. And the balance is our income tax expense, 28,000. So there you have a, a cross temporal uh, with one, one difference. Next, we're gonna go to um, we have that. Just a repeat, just to make sure you understand. Future deductible for tax return means that you got a deferred tax asset. And future taxable means you on your tax return means you have a deferred tax liability. Now let's go back to this one. We, we dealt with it before. And this was example number two. This is where we had this company that lost $10, $10 million dollars. Um, we expect that it's going to have pre-tax income of, of $1 million in year four, because this, this was recorded in year three. And we expect, it expects to earn the sufficient taxable income to utilize the NOL carry forward in future years. So as a result, because of that, we feel confident that we can create a $2.1 million asset because we expect to have more likely than not, more than 50% possibility that we're going to have future taxable income. And so we have a deferred tax asset here. So now, what if it, for part of that, uh, this deferred tax asset, which totals up at the end of, uh, to $2.1 million, and re relates to uh, Ten million dollar loss carry forward. Let's say that only five million of that can be used, and we we're saying, what if it is more likely than not, more than that five million of the future taxable income will not be realized and put on the tax return? If that's the case, 
what we have to do is because we recorded a benefit here remember this income tax benefit was a credit and it had a benefit here it reduced our loss from 10 million to 7.9 if half of that 10 million dollar income is not likely to occur it's not more likely than not to be realized then we have to set up what's called a deferred tax asset valuation allowance and it's a contra deferred tax asset. Remember we had here this deferred tax asset, which was, some of it was current, most of it was long term, totaled up to 2.1 million. But we're saying about half of that we're not going to be able to use. And so we're going to create a valuation allowance, which is a contra asset, and we're going to debit the deferred, the income tax benefit which is essentially the same thing as debiting income tax expense. Remember, we had a credit here for 2.1 million, and then we're coming along and say, yeah, but about half of that future income is not more likely than not that it's gonna happen. So we've got, we're gonna record a valuation allowance. So we have that valuation allowance and it's a contra asset to defer tax asset on the balance sheet. And I know this is really old prehistoric um, numbers example for you, but let, let me just show you how this actually, if you watch it carefully, you can make money on this. So notice that at the end of 1998, this company called Centocor um, had a deferred, these are in thousands, a deferred tax asset of $309 million at the end of 1998. And it had nothing at the end of 1997 in terms of deferred tax asset. And so let's take a look a little bit. This is what we're looking at here. And let's look in the, in the tax footnote. In the tax footnote, we go down here and we've got this loss carry forwards and tax credits that we can use and they're all going to give us future benefits. At the end of 1997, they totaled up to 301 million, but we had a valuation allowance, a full valuation allowance of 301 million. That is, it was not more likely than not that they would have future income. It was not probable that they would have future income on their tax return, so they had to establish this valuation allowance. Um, and it, at the end of the next year, 1998, that valuation allowance, the, the, the deferred tax asset, or DTA, has stayed around 300 million but the deferred tax asset valuation allowance, the reduction, the contra asset, reduced from 301 million down to 51 million. Let's read what they say about it. And I, I've highlighted this in bold. It wasn't originally highlighted in bold in the footnote. The valuation allowance for deferred tax assets in 1998 and 1997 was 50 million and 301 million respectively. The reduction of the valuation allowance is attributed to management's belief that at December 31, 1998, it is more likely than not that deferred tax assets will be realized through future earnings and or tax planning strategies. And so that's why they're saying uh, where we had a, a full valuation allowance at the end of 97, it is much smaller, um, essentially um, 250 out of 300 re is the, the amount of reduction in the, in the DTA valuation allowance. And they say it's because that's going to be realized through future earnings. Right there. Most of it was lost carry forwards. So this is, that was at December 31st of 20, of, of 1998. And then in uh, 8K, which is a significant information 
uh, about a significant transaction that the uh, company has to report. They had um, this 8K, and it says, oh, look what. On, on July 20th, 1999, um, we entered into an agreement and plan of merger, which under a wholly owned subsidiary of Johnson, a wholly owned subsidiary of Johnson and Johnson will merge with and into Cinecor in a stock for stock exchange. So they announced this in July 20th, 1999, but you could have seen this coming if you were a smart reader of those financial statements because the valuation allowance went down and that's because now Johnson & Johnson income is going to be used to offset, uh, used by, it's going to be offset by Senecor's uh, net operating loss carry forwards. In other words, Johnson & John, uh, Senecor is taking over a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. What happened? Well, uh, the closing price on the date the 10K was filed was $36.94. On the, uh, the last date of the, that it was publicly traded, it was $60.50. If you were shrewd enough, you could have been looking at this footnote and it says the reduction of the valuation allowance is attributed to management's belief that it is more likely than not that deferred tax assets will be realized through future earnings and or tax planning strategies. And they're able to use those future earnings and benefit from that. And indeed, the stock price went up considerably from $36.94 to $60.50. There is information in, in, in the financial statements. It just takes a little bit of an educator reader to see it. All right, in summary, taxable, in, taxable income and, and tax deductions follow the Internal Revenue Code. Gap, gap income and deductions follow gap rules. For example, your textbook, which is Spiceland, but more, that's just a secondary interpretation of all of the FASB statements and interpretations that a, uh, you can do it at FASB.org. GAAP requires tax costs and benefits be recorded when GAAP income or expense occurs. So we've got to record these assets and liabilities when we have GAAP income, not when the tax event occurs, because we're reporting for GAAP purposes. There are some exceptions. We don't always report all of that future benefit if we if there's reason to believe that it's not probable that we're going to be able to use those future benefits. And that's what the valuation allowance is for, for deferred tax assets. It's required if future tax benefits from a deferred tax asset are not more likely than not. And I know that's a double negative, but that's the way it, the way it is. All right, there you have uh, income tax accounting for gap purposes.